Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. I'm not sure. Well, they could probably all hear me. Uh, my name is Noah Fair, and I'm a member of the Dole. Okay, there it is. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Noah Fair, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student who would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or speaking with a student worker like myself after the program. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will assist you. Please stand if you are able and just ask one brief question. If you have any difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers for us to assist you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off all your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Associate Director, Dr. Barbara Bollard. Thank you, Noah, and thank you very much for the introduction and the welcome. Good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics for tonight's installment of the second presidential lecture series. This year, the theme for the series is Follow the Leader, Four Women's Journeys in Public Service. The Dole Institute would like to thank KU professors Mary Van Wart and Sharon Pratio, who have developed this year's series and are facilitating the sessions. Tonight's interview will be conducted by Dr. Shannon Pratio. Dr. Patillo is the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Undergraduate Programs at the KU Edwards campus and an Associate Professor in the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Her teaching and research interests include social equity, social justice, organizational theory, and law and public management. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patillo, who will introduce her guest tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Danielle Rood. And I could start with a lengthy introduction about her amazing academic career. She's a tenured associate professor at George Mason University and deputy director of the Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence. She's published over 30 peer review journal articles and received over a dozen competitive grants. But what I think is best about Danielle is that she is a role model for what it means to be a supportive colleague and a wonderful mentor. So I'd like to start by telling you a quick story about meeting her about 12 years ago. We first met when we were both on the job market in 2007. Danielle and I were both trying to get tenure track jobs, which is a difficult thing to achieve, so we kind of could have seen each other as competitors. Instead, we became quick friends, we became Facebook friends, and we talked throughout the process and ended up going to a place that had two openings, George Mason University. When we got there, we decided that the only way we were going to survive the tenure track was to be supportive of each other. This wasn't a fluffy promise. In my first year in our tenure track job, I taught my first graduate seminar. It didn't go very well. There was an older white man in the class who vocally declared that because of my gender and because of my ethnicity, I couldn't be objective in my approach to talking about civil rights. He told me that I wasn't qualified to teach, and it really threw me. The seminar wasn't going well. After one particularly horrendous class, I went to Danielle's office to vent. I expected my relatively new colleague to provide support through collective complaining. I wanted her to agree with me and comfort me and tell me that everything was wrong because of this horrible older white man and that I was doing great. Instead, she pointed out the well-stocked candy jar in her office handed me a few pieces of chocolate, 
and said, do better. She reminded me that teaching was a core part of our job and what we do and why we got into this profession. She then patiently listened while I described what was going on in the classroom. She spent time brainstorming new approaches and the class got markedly better. She checked in with me throughout the semester and after that semester we talked about teaching often. We applied for internal funds to completely redesign the capstone course in our department. We integrated our research into our teaching and we started a new research project within the classroom. Over the years, we've ended up publishing multiple articles about teaching, and both of us have gone on to win many awards about teaching, though her many more than me. She approaches her scholarship in the same way. She's an organizational sociologist striving to understand how we can improve criminal justice systems. She's rigorous in her approach, using qualitative methods to understand how policies actually work in organizations, and she expects all organizations to do better. She's direct, kind, patient, and remarkably productive. With every project, she asks how she can make the widest impact. For example, she recently started a podcast aimed at sharing research with a practitioner audience, where she actually has her students translate some of the academic work into usable information for practitioners within organizations. So I'd like to welcome our guest, Dr. Danielle Roots, and have a conversation today. Thank you. So I'd like to get started with a question that I actually ask all of my students on our first day of class. What did you want to do when you were five years old, and how in the world did you end up here? <laughs> um, ooh, that's a con if I cannot cry after that introduction, it will be good. Um, two things I wanted to do when I was five years old. Um, my mother was an antique dealer, um, and we sold antiques out of the basement of our home in upstate New York, and I wanted to be a teacher. And my mom went out to all the antique shops that she could find furniture at and collected those old uh, one-room one schoolhouse desks where the seat folds down in the front of the desk behind it. Um, and she filled the room with desks like that. And then she brought all of my stuffed animals downstairs and put them in the seats. She also bought me a gigantic chalkboard so that I could be authentic. And then she filled the room with books. Um, they were literally floor to ceiling. She built the bookshelves herself. Um, she was a single mom. My father died when I was four. So she built the entire room to look like an old-style classroom. And I taught in there every day. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. I taught in there every day after school for many, many years. And when the stuffed animals graduated, the Barbies came in. There were lots <laughs> of circulations of different things. My brother never wanted to come to my class, but every once in a while I'd convince him through bribery. Um, my other main thing that I wanted to do, and this is going to sound crazy, is that I wanted to help prisoners. Um, we lived in upstate New York, and it was about 30 minutes or so from my very small town to what I considered to be a very big city, which actually is quite small also. And it wasn't long before I realized that there was one building in town that was bigger than all the rest, um, and it had bars on the windows. I was probably, my mom thinks I was around three or four, um, when I started asking her on our shopping trips to the city if she would please go to the place where the bad people are, because that's what she told me was in there, if I would please go to the place where the bad people are because they must be lonely and we should go and talk to them. Um, it's a story that just has become the legacy of my life because the work I now do with criminal justice workers and in the classroom sort of fits with my bifurcated story that I didn't intend to tell here um, <laughs> that involves me teaching stuffed animals in the basement of my home and me wanting to make prisoners' lives better by talking to them. So you've ended up melding these two goals. Sort of, I didn't know that I did that till just this second, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> How did that educational journey look for you? Um, uh, that, growing up in upstate New York, um, I, I graduated of a class of 142, um, and I was the president of my class, um, and I uh, was one of the few people who went on to go to a four-year college. Um, maybe some number of them went to an associate's degree and then maybe finished, but I'm the only one to have a, a, a doctorate from my gra graduating class of 142. Um, it, it was not a decision that I made myself, I guess. I'm not sure how the story should be told. My grandmother was a feminist before she would tell anyone that she was a feminist. She was a farmer's wife, lived on a 200-acre farm in upstate New York. Um, she also was a, a dental hygienist assistant. She had no training, but just helped in the office sometimes when 
Um, my grandfather finally left the um, Navy and went back to work as a civil engineer. My grandmother had told me two, she told me 150,000 things over the course of my life. But the two probably biggest feminist things that she told me were, one, that I would go to college. There was no if, it was just a when. Um, and the other one was to find a job that I love, it's two part, and make enough money so I don't have to depend on a man. Um, those are really big, she wore the pants in that house. My grandfather liked to pretend he was tough, but she actually was the tougher one. Um, so those two things sort of lead me to college. I, I wanted to leave upstate New York. I wanted to live in a city that wasn't all white. Um, I wanted to live in a city. I wanted to move south. I wanted to see different culture, different food, different experiences. Everyone around me was white, and everyone around me was Republican, and everyone around me was um, poor, and everyone around me listened to Johnny Cash on the radio. Like, we ate meat and potatoes for dinner. That was sort of my upbringing. There's nothing wrong with that. I call it my Norman Rockwell childhood. I loved it, but I wanted something else. Uh, so I went to a state university in New York um, for my undergraduate degree in mass communications, only because one of my high school teachers told me I had a radio voice. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I just did television broadcasting because it sounded like I had a good voice for it. Um, and then I went, I moved immediately. After graduation, I moved to New Orleans um, on a whim, honestly, uh, and waited tables for a while in the French Quarter. And then I went back to graduate school. I was um, feeling like I wasn't getting everything I could out of my life, and my grandmother was adamantly um, opposed to me being a waitress for the rest of my life. So I went to graduate school in New Orleans. I got a degree there, and then I moved to California with my then partner and got a get into a PhD program. I didn't know that a PhD was possible for me. In fact, I didn't believe that it was. Um, he was gonna go to law school and was determined that I could do better than what I was currently doing. And my grandmother, again, told me that a PhD was the highest and that's where I should get. So I took her advice and, and uh, applied to a PhD program, only one. My partner, I, we had a small four month baby when I started um, the PhD program. My partner was moving to a place to get a job and I didn't have any other choices. I applied to one graduate school, which turned out to be a pretty good one, um, the University of California, Irvine. Luckily, I got in. I don't know what I was thinking about, not having a backup plan, but I got in, and I spent eight awesome years there. So our lecture series focuses on public service broadly conceived. How do you understand public service fitting into your career? Um, I think it takes me back to well, it takes me back to upstate New York. Um, when I was a little girl, there were no prisons within a 50 mile radius of my house. There was the one downtown jail that I went to, or wanted to go to, my mother never did stop. Um, there were no prisons. And then uh, in the 1980s, when I graduated from high school, uh, the Rockefeller drug laws and other tough on sentencing laws led New York State to be a pretty tough on crime state among many others in the US. And the prisons in New York City and down near um, Long Island began to fill up, and they started buying up um, what was defunct factory, or sorry, fa family farms in upstate New York. Um, growing up, it was plants and farms. That was what was running my um, state, and those things slowly went out of business as factory farms took over in other parts of the state. Prisons started taking over, um, and they became sort of the bane of my existence. They were everywhere. Um, there are three now within a 50 mile radius of where I grew up and there are probably seven or eight within a hundred mile radius. Every one of the people I went to high school with, all of them, every male colleague that I had all now works for an upstate New York prison. Um, and I talked to some of them pretty regularly, not all of them, but some of them. So I wanted to understand, um, for them, I wanted to understand how they changed from the person that I knew in high school into someone I didn't recognize as a correctional officer. Um, and I'm, we can go into more about that later if you're interested. Um, on the inmate side, though, on the prisoner side, I was really interested in how people got in. Um, I was really interested in what they did when they came out. Given the way that my family and my community talked about former prisoners, I wasn't certain that their life would be easy. And I wanted to think about ways to make that transition for them better. Um, before I went to graduate school, my partner went to law school in San Francisco, and I took a job at Goodwill Industries. Um, I worked in their vocational program, and I taught people how to re-enter the workplace, mostly after TANF reform out of the Clinton administration. Um, but a lot of my students, in fact, some of my favorite students were on probation or parole. And there was one class in particular, 
I was supposed to be, I taught them a lot of stuff, yeah, how to count money, how to make a resume, how to interview job skills, those sort of things. One class, I was doing mock interviews with them, and there was a big class. I didn't normally have this many students. I usually had around eight. This class, I had about 30, because they had mixed a bunch of classes together. Um, and I was asking them to do mock interviews, and I was watching them do their interviews, and they were just horrible. And I thought, my god, they can't even talk to each other. Like, what is wrong with them? And we had talked about communication. I'd had them talk out loud. I'd done all this. And I hadn't realized that all my former prisoners wouldn't look anyone in the eye. And so I, I didn't, unbeknownst to me, right, I'm naive, 20-year-old who has no idea what I'm doing in a vocational program with 45-year-old former inmates, right? I mean, I was clearly unqualified. So I was like, what is going on? So I stopped the class. I'm like, please tell me why, why, like, you have, you have to look at each other. Like, I don't, you have to at least look at the person when they're asking you a question. What are you doing? And one very rugged former gang member who actually scared me a bit stood up and said, Miss Rudes, if I look at you in prison, something bad will happen to me. And I thought, oh my God, like you've watched enough TV, you should have figured this out, right? So I'm like, stop the exercise. And so we sat around and talked. We sat in a circle and practiced making eye contact with the person across from us. And then we practiced making eye contact with the person next to us. And I just had to regroup. We didn't get through mock interviews for another week or so until we figured out how to look each other in the eye, shake hands, smile when someone says something funny. It was difficult and it was important to me because it was a life-changing moment where I realized that I wanted to go to graduate school and I wanted to study ways to improve the lives of people working in prisons and the people that are living in prisons. But I also wanted to do the day-to-day -day work that it takes to make someone's life better. So to, to now, I, now I volunteer at a couple different agencies, but to be able to work with people who are currently or formerly in custody and try to help them understand what that transition process looks like from the norms and the sort of mores that are, that are allowed in an institutional environment to how that, that experience will actually hurt them now that they're outside. And it's really easy to say it to someone and it's very difficult to get them to actually hear you. So how do you think your gender has shaped your career over time? Hmm. Um, it's tough to be a woman. Um, I, I don't know. I think my feminist grandmother made me believe that anything was possible. Um, and so I, I'm not certain that I felt, I'm not certain that I ever felt like my gender would get in the way of whatever it was that I wanted. If there was something that I believed that I could get, I didn't always understand how to get there. And frankly, I have confidence issues sometimes, and I didn't always believe that it was possible. But there was usually somebody very strong, normally my grandmother, um, with, a, with a very loud voice that said, you will. And so there wasn't any like, well, but what if I can't? It was just, you will. Um, and after she passed, it was somebody else. There was somebody strong in my life that always made me believe, interestingly, they're almost all women the strong people in my life, maybe that's how my gender moves me forward. It's the women in my life that make me believe that I can do things. Um, no offense to the men in my life, there just weren't a lot of them. Um, and it was, um, I would say as a criminologist specifically, if I'm gonna jump ahead a bit, it's challenging. Criminology is pretty quantitative and I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, it's pretty white male heavy. Um, I'm a white female, but it's a little different. Um, I don't. I don't take offense to some of the mansplaining or some of the patriarchy that some other folks do, and I think it might have to do with my, um, I want to say white trash, but I'm not sure if this is the audience to do that in. <laughs> my very poor upbringing, right, the roots that I have make me feel like I was probably sexually and otherwise harassed most of my life. Um, it was not uncommon for that to happen as a child, for someone to pull you onto their lap or give you a tap on your bum. Um, I don't, today it doesn't feel, it feels wrong to me as a woman of the 2018s or 19s. It, I understand where it comes from because I witnessed it my whole life. And so I wouldn't say that the departmental dynamics or the disciplinary dynamics necessarily bother me. I, I actually take them as a challenge to overcome and just do better. Well, it's interesting that there's that discussion of how normalized those dynamics are, but then still a push to change them. So what, what do you think your role is in that? And what do you think kind of the broader, you mentioned department or discipline, 
how do you separate your expectations of yourself and then the expectations of organizations and society? Hmm. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I, I think I know where my boundaries are, and maybe they're a little further out than where other people's are, but I don't let people cross them without letting them know that they cross them. Um, it would be unlike me to file a grievance or um, go to some higher power. I would go to the person who directly wronged me and say, sorry, that, that's out of bounds. It happened a lot when I was pregnant, actually. You know this about pregnant women. Everyone wants to touch your belly. Um, I'm a big toucher. I like to hug and like shake hands and be around people, but I only really like to do that to people I know. For some reason, when you're pregnant, people believe that they can just manhandle you or womanhandle you, and it's very, it was very uncomfortable for me. Um, so I would set boundaries all the time. At the time, first, my first pregnancy, I was living in San Francisco, and I was living in Oakland, but commuting to San Francisco, and on the BART, which is their metro rail system, daily, someone was groping my belly, right? They could actually see the baby moving, and they'd want to feel it, or they just thought that I was neat, and they just wanted to touch a baby. I don't know what, I don't know what they were doing. But I really quickly decided that, like, boundaries had to get set, right? So for a while the unconfident me, or the inconfident me, I'm not sure what the word is, I wore really big clothes so that maybe I wouldn't look pregnant. I just might look a little like I ate some extra cheese. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I'm obese. I can't possibly pass this off as like, I'm not gonna be able to make this happen. So then I just had to verbally be like, okay, I, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Please don't touch my baby or my body. Like there's, and I was like really uncomfortable, but I think that that was appropriate. Now as a scholar, I definitely advocate for my students more than I would advocate for myself. So if one of my students comes to me and says they feel um, wronged, not just about gender, but also about race or ethnicity or religion or any other issue that they're having, um, I, I'm a strong advocate for them. I will go to the professor or the graduate student who had this problem or try to talk it through with them. I even have recommended they go to the diversity office or wherever it is they need to go. It is unlike me to do that myself. I usually handle my own issues. I don't mean to say that those avenues aren't super productive, and if I ran into a wall, I think I would use them. So far, I've usually been able to move people around to seeing that, that their behavior is inappropriate. So you've mentioned your grandmother and other strong women in your life. You've also mentioned the role that you play as an advocate. How do you see mentoring play out in your career, both mentors that you've had and then your role as a mentor? Oh, um, mentorship tied to advocacy. Hmm. So I have... Probably the, oh, I don't know, there's a million mentors in my life, but in graduate school, the two that get me to my career um, are Joan Petersilia, who's a pretty famous criminologist who was at Irvine for, was at Rand Institute for 25 years as their head of criminal justice research. She's actually one of the two people who coined the term prisoner reentry, um, and she coined it with Jeremy Travis, who was then head of the Urban Institute. They were good friends. Um, and she started a reentry class at the University of California, Irvine, my end of my first year or my second year in graduate school, but it was in the criminology program. And I was a sociologist. And the program was closed. Joan was very famous and had a good number of students working for her on the criminology side, which was an entirely different school in my university. It was in the School of Social Ecology. It wasn't even in the social sciences. Um, I learned from a, a, another doctoral student that she was hosting this class, and I just crashed it, which is so not like me. But I really wanted to understand how prisoners reenter. So I just walked in and sat down, and she very strongly wanted to know what I was doing there. It was eight of her students, her doctoral students, and that was it. And I basically begged for her to let me stay, um, and she asked me what department I was coming from, and I said sociology, and she made a sort of <laughs> sound. And then she said, you can stay for this one class, and after today I'll decide if you can stay at all. So I stayed for the one class, which was really fun because she hadn't designed a syllabus. She had decided to bring in everything that she had written around this area before it was called prisoner reentry, because nobody was writing about prisoner reentry in the early 2000s. She brought in everything from her friend Jeremy and then a bunch of other people that she knew that I now think are amazing scholars that she just were friends of hers, Mark Maurer, whoever, like people she just thought were cool. And I was like, oh my God. She said, lays it all on the table and tells us to make a syllabus. So we read as much as we could, we discussed as much as we could, and we sort of put it into piles and then we created our own syllabus. I think I did well because at the end of the class she told me that I could stay and I stayed with her for eight years. 
I was in every class that she taught. She was, I'm the only sociology student that she ever was on an outside, was the outside member of a dissertation committee. Um, I went to Stockholm when she won the criminology's equivalent of the Nobel Prize, the Stockholm Prize in Criminology. Um, and now she is nearing retirement. She'll retire at the end of this year. And the last email I got from her said, come to Santa Barbara and have a drink. We're not talking about work. She is one of the many loves of my life. Um, and she inspired me to think about policy in a way that I never had before. She's a policy scholar. That's what she does. That's what she did at Rand. It's what she did at Irvine. And it's what she did at Stanford for the last maybe seven or eight years that she's been there. I, I was thinking about people on the ground, about inmates, prisoners, probationers, parolees at, at Goodwill, about TANF reform, um, people who are in the TANF reform system. She made me think about policies and sentences at the very top of the system and how those trickle down and affect those at the bottom. So my bottom-up approach met with her top-down approach and made me start to think about ways to advocate for people. The problem is that I wanted to be an academic, and to be an academic and to be an advocate, in my mind, at least in my own department at Mason, are two entirely different things. I can't push my case for tenure forward as an advocate and I can't push my case for full professor forward as an advocate. I can push it forward as a solid empirical researcher who maybe does some advocacy on the side. So I, I decided to take Joan's advice at the policy level, take my own mentor from sociology, Dr. Calvin Morrill, who's now a, a dean at Berkeley, um, and I also, f another great love of my life, um, Cal wanted me to look at institutions. He's the one who taught me institutional theory or organizational theory. He was also an ethnographer, which means he was trained by an anthropologist to understand ethnography like the way that um, in old movies, anthropologists like get sent off to Nigeria for a year and they live there for a year among the people to learn what they do. That's the way that he learned ethnography and he trained me that. So by the time I was done at Irvine, I had policy level, organizational level, an individual level analysis for what I was thinking about in terms of prisoners and prisoner reentry. I also have these correctional officers in my back pocket. These are my friends, people I grew up with, who are now turning into someone I don't recognize before my eyes. And I start to think about reform, but I'm also a realist. I don't think we're going to stop using solitary confinement in my lifetime. I don't think we're probably going to stop using prisons in mine or my children's lifetime. But if we're going to have to have them, then I want to do the very best that I can. And I want to do the best by the people who are incarcerated there and by the people who are employed there, who often have some of the same issues that inmates have, believe it or not. So I try to find a balance between the researcher in me that I want to say selfishly, but it's actually selfish and for my children, that gets me promoted and gets me employed. Um, that research part of me is really important. It's what drives the bus in my life, and it's what gets me up in the morning happy. But there's also the sort of civil service or public service side of me that wants to do better, wants to do well by those people that are working in corrections and wants to do by well, by well by the inmates who have to spend so much time there and then in their transition into the community. So I really try to balance. It seems like a whole lot of things. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm going in a circle. Three levels, three things, selfish. <laughs> you got it. There's the recap. Well, you mentioned two really important mentors in your life, and I know because I know many of the students that you've mentored, that you're an incredible mentor. Right. What do you think are some of the expectations you have for yourself as a mentor? Hmm. Um, I think both Cal and Joan had really different styles. So for Joan, it was quick and fast, right? Quick, like, tell me what you need, here it is, bye. Like, that was just sort of how she mentored. If you could get her in the car to drive to a prison, you got an enormous day with her. But in the office, there was a line of students out the door. It was very difficult to get long periods of time with her. Cal would sit in the office with me for four hours straight. He would just close the door, and if somebody else came, he'd open the door and say, I'm still in a meeting, can we reschedule? Um, and so I think I try to find a balance between that approach um, to try to mentor my students. But the number one thing I think, if I'm thinking about mentoring, I think maybe there's two. One, I listen to them. I really try to listen. Cal always opened his door and made me feel like I was human. Even when he used words, he's a Harvard grad, used words that were way above my head. I would say, Cal, Harvard, tell me what that means in my language. And he would give it to me in real life language. Um, but I, I loved him for one, making time for me. He was the chair of the department, not just a professor. So I'm not sure how he did that. 
Um, and we didn't schedule four-hour meetings. We scheduled one-hour meetings that turned into four, and his whiteboard would get erased, and I'd take a picture, and re-erased, and I'd take a picture. He was tremendous. Um, the other thing with my students is I ask them what they want. Um, and I do this with probationers, and I do this with prisoners, and I do this with my mentees. Very first meeting with my students, I ask them what they want. They don't have to stick to that plan, because most of them change their minds 100 times before they graduate. But many of them have an idea of what they want. Do they want to go into academia? In academia? Do they want to go into public service? Do they want to work for the government? Because my university is so close to DC, I have a lot of students who ne don't necessarily want a traditional academic path. Um, do they want grant writing? Do they want to learn qualitative methods? Do they want public speaking? Are they afraid to conference present? Whatever it is that they need. I have a notebook that I keep notes for all my students in. Um, and then I check in with them every couple of weeks, every couple of months. Like, is, are we still on track? Is this what you want? Uh, um, I was also an athlete in high school and, and in college, and I think about game plans. So I, I really think about, like, if you want this, I have to get you there. How do I help get you there? So I create different game plans for each of my mentees. I don't discuss with them the game plan because usually if you tell them the whole thing, it kind of blows their mind. <laughs> but I have sort of a five-year plan for them that they don't actually know what it is. Um, maybe that's a lot of trickery. I hope they're not watching the live feed. <laughs> like, they're on to me now. Um, I do a lot of... Um, I do, oh, I'm saying this out loud. I do a lot video. Of, I know. I do a lot of making them believe that they have created their own solution to a problem that I've already solved for them. I want to make sure that they know that they have options, but I'm also really careful to be sure that they're choosing things that are wise for them. I would never choose for them, ever, but I want to sort of direct them in a way that moves them toward what they want. I have a, a for example, if I have a student that wants to be an academic and decides she's going to take an FBI internship, I might strongly advise against that, and I might try to position her to do research with me over the summer and see if maybe I can change her mind. I had a student who wanted to work in, um, who believed she wanted to work at a think tank environment, and I believed her strongly, but I also didn't want her to sell herself short because she's a heck of an academic, and no offense to think tanks, but I, I thought she would make an amazing teacher. Um, so I asked her politely, didn't make her, if she would maybe teach a class or two and come guest lecture in my class. She did. I lost. She still wants to work in a think tank. She really rocked it. The students loved her, and she actually loved it, but she doesn't want it as a full-time job. Um, but it was a good call for her. She never, she didn't think about it. She wasn't going to do it. It was not a thing. She wasn't going to teach. I thought, you know, if, if she doesn't take some chances, she's never going to know if that's exactly what she should do. Um, so I work with them in that way. I guess I, I wouldn't say that I, I steer them on purpose to hurt them. I would say I steer them on purpose to make sure that they fulfill the dream that they told me they had. So what do you think at this point in your career, you're well-established, accomplished, you have tenure, what role do you see mentors still playing for you? So I, I run a graduate, um, I run a, uh, a, sorry, a research center at George Mason University, uh, the Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence. And one of the things that we developed there is a thing called the nested mentoring model that Shannon and I have talked about many times, we've written about. Um, the nested mentoring model is, in just my personal example, it's me mentoring my graduate students to mentor undergraduate students. Um, and so the idea is, I, I had a son who went to a Montessori kindergarten, so I thought, or Montessori preschool. It's kind of that idea, right? That the older kids in a Montessori environment don't necessarily move classes until they're skill ready, right? They move up when they're skill ready. And then the older kids and the younger kids are mixed together in classes so that older children can teach younger children how to do whatever it is, wipe a table or put the triangles together or whatever it is that they're doing, sandpaper letters. Um, and so I think about that when I think about mentoring one, I don't have time to do the thorough job of mentoring that with 30 students or 20 students that I might have on any given semester. Um, but I can mentor five of them to also mentor the other 25. I'm still there for the other 25. They still can call me. They all have my cell phone number, and believe me, they use it. They email. They come to the house. We have lunches. We talk or whatever. But in that way, I'm mentoring my doctoral students, usually to mentor my master's students. Sometimes I mentor my higher up, my um, more advanced doctoral students to mentor the, the lower level or brand new doctoral students so that they get a sort of peer-to-peer -peer relationship. I also think that they're the next generation of scholars and when I retire they're still gonna be working 
Um, so I'd like them to have that network of people to call on. We didn't have that formal system at Irvine, but we definitely made it up as we went along where more advanced cohorts helped mentor younger cohorts or um, Cal was really good about sort of share the wealth. So when somebody got a grant, we all celebrated that grant. Everybody got the grant when someone got one, a graduate student. So when I got an NSF dissertation grant, the entire department came out to celebrate my big win. And then my grant went into one of Cal's files. And then that file became an open file for anyone else in the department who wanted to go after an NSF. And Cal didn't require, but asked me politely if I would please teach a workshop in how I got an NSF grant. So we did it jointly. He talked about how to mentor me to get one. I talked about how to write one to get the grant. I really, I'm not sure I knew what I was doing. I think it was just luck or good timing, because the pools are different each year. Um, but then after that, two more people got an NSF grant. And so then the three of us taught that workshop. And then the third year, another person got the grant. And the three of them taught the workshop. And I just came and listened. And Cal came and listened. And so it was this sort of like give back mentality where you sort of, every time you learn something, you find somebody else to teach it to. And I think that's kind of what I do when I mentor. It's definitely how I mentor my mentees to be mentors. So what advice would you have for people at various stages of their career? What do you wish you knew when you were just starting out that you know now? Hmm. Wow. I think I learned a lot of stuff along the way. What do I wish I knew now? That is a really good question. Some of the things I didn't know when I started. Um, I, Shannon mentioned it in her introduction. She mentioned that we could have been competitive. We both came to a tenure track position straight out of a grad program. Um, Shannon was 14 years younger than me. Still am. Yeah, is. <laughs> She's also a punk. Um, 14 years younger than me, and I was frightened to death of her. I had a three-year-old and a seven-year-old at home. I had taken eight years to get through my doctoral program. Shannon had taken four. I, uh, it's a long story of Shannon's many accomplishments, but I was frightened. I thought, like, there's no universe in which I get tenure, right? We're both going to go up the same year. They're going to give tenure to her and not to me. And I went back into my, like, soul of souls and thought, like, this isn't going to go well, right? She's your friend. You know her. We weren't friends' friends, but we were friends. We hadn't gotten to know each other yet, and I thought, you know, I have to figure this out because I can't live like this. I don't want to be a junior faculty member with a faculty member that I feel competitive with. I don't want to go to work every day like that. I want to find, find a way for us to be successful together. And so I went to her and told her that I was scared that she was going to basically kick my butt, and I was going to get fired, and she was going to get tenure. And she amazingly came clean that she was frightened of me because I was so much more accomplished than her and so much older than her and she was afraid that the department would see her as a child. Um, and so we had a meeting of the minds that day over coffee and decided that we were going to pull each other through to tenure and we were going to publish together and write together and write different things but in the same space so that we were forcing each other to write. We had a series of check-ins like how'd you do on this, how'd you do on this. We made our calendar together every semester so that we each knew what each other was working on and how long that was approximately going to take. We went after grants together and separately. Um, it, it was a phenomenal experience, and that's something that I learned along the way. It's something Shane and I probably learned together, but it's definitely something that I wish I knew earlier than that first week because that whole summer when I agonized about working with her would have been a lot easier if I just made a phone call earlier on. But I counsel people now, uh, junior f faculty, about this. We have three brand new faculty in my department right now, and I've gone to lunch with all of them and told them this same story, that the three of you are not in competition with each other, no matter how much you feel that that's true. I have a gr series of grad students right now who are applying to, master students who are applying to graduate programs. One of them was in my office last week in tears because an undergrad who I also mentored got into a very prestigious doctoral program, and she was crying because she was my master's student and she hasn't heard if she got in yet, which is probably not a great sign. And I gave her the, like, you are not in competition with this woman. You don't know how she got accepted, and you're accepted here, and there are other places that will want you. We had the long sort of cry out together. I held my tears back, but I wanted to cry with her. Um, 
I think that competition is um, healthy to some level, but I also think that it's really important not to compete when competition is unnecessary. And academia is a rigorous cutthroat industry where we get rejected pretty much daily for not being smart enough, not writing well enough, not having a good enough outline. I got a rejection once that told me I wasn't empirical, despite the fact that we had spent over a year in the field. Um, it, you know, I don't, it, I, I want them to believe that the world is a better place and when the world that they've chosen to work in is unkind to them, I want them to remember my mentorship told them that they always have an inner circle of beautiful people who will make them feel good. They just have to go back there and I'll always be in it. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for our conversation and I want to open it up for anyone who has questions. I know that we have students with mics, so if you have a question, please join the conversation. So tell me why recidivism rates are so high. Oh. And, why? And, why, and why they, I'm sorry, and why they don't come down. There's a lot of good answers. I'll give you a few short and simple ones. Um, let's see. Starting in the 1980s, we um, increased mandatory minimum sentences. Um, we also took away prison programming in the 1970s after, a, there's a lot of reasons, but the most famous answer is a very famous article um, written by a man um, named Robert Martinson who had some pretty faulty methods at the time and determined that not much works in institutional corrections in terms of programming. After that, we saw a very large and widespread um, reduction in programming inside, prisoners, inside prisons for prisoners, which would overall contribute to the recidivism rate. We also saw sentence lengths dramatically increase, um, upwards of 800 times longer sentences um, in some places for certain sentences. The incarceration rate then increases because we have um, tough on crime policies that start at the state level. Um, they also start at counties and jurisdictions, but then they go through the judicial system and then through the jail and prison system. So along the way, people are getting sent to prison for lesser uh, offenses. Their sentence lengths are longer. And they're, once, once they're in prison, they, the number of prison programs is dramatically reduced. Um, I don't know how many inmates currently receive programming, but um, in many states, the numbers are less than 10% of all prisoners will get any form of programming. And I want to just make a note that as an empirical researcher, programming in prison does not equate with good programming in prison. So I attend those classes and, I mean, seriously, they're not good. Um, so we may believe that our prisons and jails have programs that are offering reentry or offering um, alcohol and drugs or alco alcohol and drug treatment or programming of that sort or mental health classes or anger management classes. Most of those classes are not evidence-based classes. We don't have a lot of evidence base to support many of those classes anyway. We haven't, either they haven't designed a good enough class or we haven't rigorously tested it well enough to show that there's an evidence base. And then if we did, we'd have to find out if it, in one jurisdiction where we tested it, if it also works someplace else. Um, so we have a large number of people coming out of institutions with untreated diagnoses for mental health. We have a large number of them who have alcohol and drug addiction that doesn't get treated in institutional spaces. It just gets sort of exacerbated with uh, prevalence of alcohol and drugs inside institutions. Or it's still a problem, even though they didn't have any alcohol and drugs in prison, they're still addicts when they are removed from that space. Um, there's also a large poverty problem. People that went in, um, not all of them, but a, a large number of them were un or underemployed, uneducated. The average educational um, attainment for a prisoner in the United States is the 11th grade, but the average reading and math scores for a prisoner in the United States is around a fourth or fifth grade level. These are folks that don't have a bright future in front of them. They didn't have one before prison and they certainly don't have one afterward. And nothing that we're doing while they're in custody is making it any more likely that they're gonna do better in their life post-release. There's a number of really great criminologists who've studied this um, pretty intently, um, Dan Nagan being one of them, who, uh, and uh, um, Frank Cullen being another, who argue that um, prisons in the United States actually have a pretty strong criminogenic effect. We don't correct our prisoners when they're in, we actually make them worse. They're far more likely to recidivate post-release than they are when they entered.
I was interested in some of your comments where you, you were talking about um, many uh, prison staff people having some of the same problems mm -hmm. as prisoners and also the people that you knew in your youth and how they had become different people. And I, we just got the news today that one of our prisons here in Kansas has uh, been put in a state of an emergency because they're right. down like 92 staff members or something like that and because they can't fill those positions. And I just, I just wanted you to expand on that, uh, yeah. those thoughts a little bit. It's a rough haul for them. Um, most prisons take correctional officers who have a high school education. There isn't usually a requirement for higher education. Sometimes they want an associate's degree or the equivalent of working in some form of security or law enforcement for a year or two. However, across the United States, it's pretty low. They also dramatically vary on how long they train folks. So there are places, um, there are places in the U.S. I don't have my lecture slides in front of me, so I can't remember which states they are, and I'm, I don't want to call them out and have it be wrong. So I'm just going to say states, where the training might only be four weeks long. Um, there are other places where the training might be four or five months long, and then there's a maybe six month apprenticeship program where you're working under the supervision of a lieutenant or a deputy, or you're working under the supervision of a more uh, more um, tenured uh, correctional officer. Working in a corrections environment, in my view, and I, I don't want to cite research here, I actually want to say what I think I understand, um, is basically incarcerating them. Not to the same degree, right? They're not locked in a six by nine foot cell. They don't face mandatory lockdowns, but they're facing 20 to 25 years behind bars because that's how long it takes for them to clear a pension. So 20 to 25 years working in an institutional environment where you are um, afraid even if you claim you're not afraid, you're afraid. People are dying, people are getting knifed or beaten or in, in an everyday, those are rarities actually, in an everyday occurrence you're getting bodily fluids thrown from a cell onto you, um, urine or feces or someone spits on you, um, you're getting yelled at, you're at risk of having to interfere in something that to break something up. There's a lot of um, physical and emotional toll that, that it takes on them. Correctional officers in the United States have one of the highest rates of alcoholism of all professions. They're up there with doctors and lawyers. Professors aren't up there, so I'm doing well. <laughs> um, uh, alcoholism, drug abuse, anxiety, depression, PTSD, divorce, domestic violence, all in the highest ranges for correctional officers. And they will spend 20 to 25 years in this, in this job wanting this pension, sort of going for this thing that they believe that they've earned or that they deserve. When they're finished, though, they don't look the same, and they don't act the same, and they're not the same person. And I could probably say the same thing about law enforcement. Chuck can probably weigh in, but law enforcement positions tend to have these high rates of, of anxiety or depression or alcoholism or, or just trauma. They face a lot of trauma. I talk to COs after they've witnessed a man commit suicide or attempt suicide, um, and it it weighs on them. Even if they didn't like the inmate, even if they have a real tough on crime, he deserves to be here, he did the t crime, do the time sort of stance, it's not every day that you see a man try to kill, him, kill himself or actually succeed at doing that. So I, I really try to think about them. The sociologist in me is the lover of the downtrodden, right? That's who I am as a human being. It was the four-year-old in my mom's car wanting to stop at the jail. But I realized many years later that the downtrodden also work in that facility. They're not just the inmates in that facility. They've taken a job in a place where there are no other jobs because that's what they could do to support their family. They didn't understand the mental and physical toll it was going to take on their bodies, and they probably don't understand it now. When I ask them about it, they very rarely can tell me that they have any form of mental illness, but they can all tell me they've been divorced. They can all ask me out for a drink after work. They can all say that they live at this local bar. It's like cheers over there. We go there every night. It's, the symptoms are there. They just don't always want to tell you what they are. So I feel for them, and I, I advocate for them in my work as much as I advocate for the inmates now because I think it's actually a bifurcated system of pain that affects everyone, not just the people who are incarcerated there, but the people who have to work there. Danielle, over the next three to five years, are there any particular areas of research or policy that you're trying to impact? Yes, thank you. I didn't mention that. Um, I've, been, I've spent the last two years working in solitary confinement, so restricted housing units, in prisons in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania has a pretty reform-minded um, Secretary of Corrections at the moment, um, Secretary Wetzel. 
and he is doing a lot of reform around prisons in Pennsylvania. And pr Pennsylvania is a lot of prisons. If you're not familiar, you know it's a big state. They also have 25 facilities in the state, uh, two female, and then the rest are male. Um, we have spent time in seven institutions over the last two years inside their solitary confinement units. So one, first of all, big shout out to Pennsylvania for allowing researchers inside their solitary confinement units. Most states and jurisdictions will not allow researchers in. My own home state of Virginia, I think, would laugh and hang up on me if I asked for that. Um, solitary confinement in Pennsylvania is being reformed in a couple of really cool ways, but we don't know if they work yet. So Pennsylvania has decided to limit the number of days that people will spend in solitary for disciplinary infractions. So if you are one of those inmates who happens to throw feces on a correctional officer, you will get a disciplinary infraction that will probably land you in solitary confinement. Pennsylvania calls it the Restricted Housing Unit, RHU. Instead of sending you down there indefinitely and waiting till you are good and ready to get out, they usually give you around a 30 to 60 day window now, maybe 90. Um, and that time can get shortened with uh, weekly meetings with what's called the, um, the PRC, it's their review committee, um, so that you can actually get out early. They have also taken um, all of their severely mentally ill inmates, they call them SMI, severely mentally ill inmates, out of regular, regular solitary confinement and put them in a new unit called the Diversionary Treatment Unit. It's a step-down unit where, unit where the instead of only getting five hours a week outside of their cell, which is what typical solitary confinement inmates get, um, the DTU, the Diversionary Treatment Units, get 23 hours a week outside of their cell. They get a heavy dose of programming. They get da daily psychiatric contact, um, and they also get um, an incentive-based program to help them earn their way out earlier to get back into um, the, the general population. Um, so our work in solitary confinement has really been about, oh sorry, the third one is making them go there less often. So they're trying to become even more tolerant of disciplinary infractions so that maybe the first or second offense won't land you down there or maybe if you have mental illness they might not think about sending you there. Even if it isn't severe they might give you a different option. You could get um, general population cell lockdown where maybe you limit your, you know, get some restrictions, maybe they limit your commissary or something like that but they don't remove you and send you down to what the inmates would call the hole. Um, so for the last two years we've been in there, the first year was pretty uh, rugged and pretty informative, but at a very base level. It's been a very long time since a researcher has had ethnographic access to solitary confinement, and so we really just needed to get our feet wet. This second summer we went back in and really dug deep into a couple of key areas that we're interested in, and we are now in the midst of writing a report to the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections to help them improve. It is not an evaluation. We were not hired to do an evaluation. We were just hired to find out what is working and what isn't down there according to the inmates and the staff. It's not, I can do program evaluation, but that's not what we were doing. Um, so we're going to make some fairly baseline recommendations. Probably the most formative recommendation um, is going to be to feed them. They have, a pretty ad, they have a pretty intense administrative problem with providing food to their inmates in the RHU environment. All of the prisons that we've been to have a very specific meal policy and it's administratively sound. So I'm a CO, I have 100 inmates in my RHU to feed and I have about 15 minutes to get every single tray through every single wicket, which is the hole in the door. The meals come down hot in Pennsylvania. They serve at least two, usually three hot meals a day, which means I got to get the food out while it's hot. So I need to move, right? And there's not that many of them. You have a shortage in Kansas. There's a shortage in Pennsylvania as well. So I got to move. That trays come in. I, op I go to the door. If man isn't standing at his door ready to accept the tray, I don't open his wicket. I go to the next one. And I go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And I don't have time to go back to him because he missed his tray. He misses breakfast. Too bad. Then I have to do 100 rounds of picking up all the trays and they have to be completely empty. Some inmates hold their trays, some inmates bang their trays, some inmates aren't done eating and don't want you to take their tray, right? There's lots of stuff that goes on. So administratively, it makes perfect sense that I'm not going to provide all the meals because the inmates know the rules. Stand at your wicket, ready to accept the tray. When I open the wicket, you take it. That's how it works. From an inmate's perspective, though, you can imagine what that means. They're on a very limited caloric diet. They're eating prison food, which you probably don't know, but I know it's not that great. I eat there all the time. Um, and I'm a vegetarian, so I have a little more difficulty than they do. I'm not sure if they eat the meat products that are provided, but maybe, maybe they're vegetarians too, because I'm not sure all of it's meat. Um, they, they don't get a meal, right? So you know how you are when you don't get a meal. 
You also, so you're hangry, right? And then it's expected that you're gonna do the same thing for the next meal, right? Wait at your door and get the thing. Well, what if you're asleep? Or what if you're at group? Or what if you're somewhere else? You also don't get fed again. There's also some level of retaliation, and this is a weird one. I haven't finished analyzing this, but the COs actually say they retaliate more than the inmates do. It's a pretty interesting dynamic there. Um, and so you can go a while without getting your food. Now, when I ask the inmates, a good number of them just say they were sleeping. Now, you could say, and I would say, well, wake up, dummy, right? Your food is coming. You should know when to wake up. There's no formal announcement that food is being served. There's no alarm clocks in the cell. There's no way for them to know what time it is because the lights are on 24 hours a day. It's like going to Vegas, right? You go in the casino, you have no idea what time it is when you leave. In most of those institutions, those lights are on 24 hours a day. They don't know what time it is, and their sleep is, is messed up. So they can sleep at a variety of times. Take that aside and take out the inmates who are medicated. They physically can't wake up. So they may miss two, three, four, five meals before they're actually fed again. And it shouldn't be surprising to anyone in this room why those inmates have more misconducts. They're angry and they're hungry. And I mean, to look at them, they're gaunt. So it isn't just them saying that they're hungry. They're, they're losing weight like crazy. Um, and so I think about that as a very, very baseline, right? Not only does it help the inmates to get some food, but our suggestion is going to be to provide an alternative meal, a cold option for inmates who aren't at their door. So in the local jail where I do work, they provide a bologna sandwich, a banana or an orange because they have the most stamina for withholding whatever's gonna happen to them, a cookie and a thing of milk. You could stick that in a wicket without the inmate being present and the inmate might get sick of bologna, but at least they'd have something edible to eat. So one of our suggestions to Pennsylvania is gonna be to come up with another option so the tray doesn't have to go through the wicket and the inmate could get something else. Um, it could be a granola bar, it could be, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it is, but just something to tide them over because they missed their meal. Um, and then we're gonna do some administrative data follow-up to see the, how if the number of grievances decrease with this one, it's a quasi-experimental, it's not, I'm not building a rocket here, but the idea is to think about what could happen when you make such small changes. Thank you, that was really helpful uh, to put it, put it together, how your research so directly impacks that. that I'm hoping, they I could say so no. so much right there. And, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and if somebody doesn't study that and, and get that communicated, you know, it doesn't get addressed. Um, here locally in our county, um, there's been an effort to expand our jail here. Um, they've been pretty proud of their programs, and I don't know whether they were good or not, but mm -hmm. they did win some awards, and there seemed to be some decrease on the recidivism. Um, however, there was a real backlash against um, expanding the jail, somewhat understandably here in a progressive community, because they saw that as, um, it was, uh, it was a certain segment saw that as a largely uh, repressive kind of. Um, just, uh, I just wonder if you could speak to whether the, um, um, what we're finding is the jail is so crowded then it's cutting down on the time that they have outside their cells and we're having to send uh, inmates to other counties so then the programming comes apart and then um, the officers are more concerned about their own safety and it's more dangerous and they're having to put more people in rooms and different levels together. Do you see that as a factor, is um, how crowded our jails are, as is that one factor within the recidivism rate? Hmm. I, I would imagine yes, but I, I would need to see the data in order to be able to say for sure. It works differently in different systems. Um, I think it's, you know, it's not their fault that they're getting an influx of inmates, right? Uh, they're, they're getting them from somewhere else. It's not like the COs are walking around the streets of Kansas and picking people up to incarcerate. It's coming from the system as a sort of system, right? So it comes from the way that police officers are trained to arrest or what they're trained to arrest on, it, the laws or the, the rules of your jurisdiction. And then it falls through the, the prosecutor's office, which cases they decide to put through. It goes to the, I'm being very simplistic here just to, for time, but it gets through the judges and then who they decide to sentence and what your, what your sentencing guidelines look like in Kansas to be able to determine who will go in. So there's lots of reasons why your jail's filling up. I would argue as a prison researcher that 
in general, and I don't know the case in your particular town, I've never done research here, so I don't know what would be the answer, but in general, it's never a good idea, or it's rarely a good idea to incarcerate people who have a pretty low risk of recidivism and may have a moderate to high, or low, moderate, or high level of dynamic risk factors. So those are needs, things that, that you could probably take care of in your community. Um, it's usually very expensive to incarcerate people, um, upwards of usually around 10 to 1, what it costs to put someone in prison as it would be to keep them in the community and put them in some sort of community program. Um, jails are not, and I don't know yours, so I don't want to speak specifically, but jails are not famous for having evidence-based programs. They're famous for developing their own programming. Um, and then there's a, there's a word in organizational science that we use called isomorphism, um, where sort of, uh, there's a bunch of different forms of it. There's a coercive form of isomorphism where one institution will do something and another one will sort of feel pressured to do that. Um, there's mimetic isomorphism where they just sort of copy each other. And then there's normative isomorphism. It becomes so normal over time that people start to think that that's the only way to do things. Um, and it happens in organizational systems pretty regularly. Um, and I would say that jails are, 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 are faulty of this, right? They will go to a jail conference, um, the American Corrections Academy conference, and they sit around with vendors, and they talk to other jailers or other correctional personnel, and they find out what, hey, what are you doing in Kansas? Well, we're doing this. And what are you doing in Kentucky? We're doing this. And they come up with these great ideas about what will work inside their jails. Some of them have never been tested by any of them, by anyone. Some of them maybe really worked great in Kentucky and have great evidence base, but when you move them to Kansas, the offender population is different and they don't work here. You don't get the same results. So it's pretty difficult to know if overcrowding is a problem. I, if you're making me guess, I would say yes, but I think there's a whole host of other problems that lead to the recidivism problem that you probably have in Kansas and that we definitely have nationwide. The study I read yesterday was 83% um, of all offenders will reoffend in their first nine years now post release. Just not surprising, given that we didn't do anything to change their circumstance or do anything to change what is possible for them. It's like, to, it, it, it would be like if I said to my children, I'd say this to my class all the time, my kid draws on the wall with crayons and I take him upstairs to his room and I put him in there for nine years. And when he comes out, I expect that he's not going to draw on the wall with crayon anymore. Well, really? I'm pretty sure he might want to really draw more because he's pissed, right? He's mad. Or he might just be like over crayons and moved on to markers. Or he learned from one of his brothers, who I also incarcerated, that punching a hole in the wall might be, have a larger effect, right? It's this criminogenic effect. Like, how do I not get in there again? I run, I flee, or I try to figure out a way around it. I didn't do anything while he was in there to make him a better human. I don't know why I expect him to be better when he comes out. Well, I want oh. here's the Here's the oddest question of the night. All right. How do you think the Me Too movement will affect corrections? And I can give you my reason for asking. Go ahead. Is... Uh, I spend time at the women's prison here in Topeka, and the common thread that I see among inmates is they've never been believed. It's a good answer. I know, I'll give you one. I think the Me Too movement started in corrections before the Me Too movement. It started with the Prison Rape Elimination Act in 2003. Um, and it's a, it's a long rollout, so some institutions are just really getting on board in the last few years. I don't think the Prison Rape Elimination Act is the silver bullet. It's not the answer to all of our prayers, but I definitely believe it was a good first start to helping to understand sexual violence in prison, not only against the correctional officers, but also against the inmates. It goes kind of both ways. It, it is bringing the idea of sexual misconduct or sexual assault or sexual trauma to light in a way that makes it more talked about. Um, it's not perfect. I mean, Shannon and I are actually working on a paper now with some colleagues um, where many of the correctional staff see PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, as an administrative burden. Um, they're having a hard time figuring out how to use it and what it means. It doesn't mean that it's all bad, though. I think even talking about it is a big step in the right direction, and it's one of the reasons that I really am in love with the Me Too movement, for making people feel like they could say their truth, whatever it is, and to feel like 
even if you're not sure if you believe it, they still have a right to speak it. They have a right to say whatever happened to them or whatever they believe is wrong. And I think that that's true in carceral spaces. And I wouldn't say even more so, but I would say equally so. Those spaces where you don't have the, you, you can't get away, you can't run, you can't flee, you, and in the power dynamic is daily and minute to minute, it's, it is different for them. And I think it's a nice way to open that up. So far, I haven't been overwhelmed by the response to Me Too or Priya in carceral spaces, um, but I think it takes a while to work through that stuff. Um, I'm working in probation as well, and probation officers are not super excited about something called trauma-informed care. Um, they think it's really, it's the same dialogue that they always have about hug a thug, right? These are bad people, why would I hug them? Like, they deserve to be punished. There's sort of this idea. But, but over many years, I think it sort of wanes a little bit. People start, it starts to become normative. Some of the old curmudgeon members of the force sort of retire and the newbies come in and it becomes normative for them because it was how they were trained. It's also so common. I mean, on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on whatever else you go, Me Too, maybe not Prison Rape Elimination Act, unless you're me, it's prevalent on my Facebook feed, but it's probably not on yours. Um, it just becomes more commonplace and people feel more comfortable. So I'm hoping that Me Too is just another push in that direction for staff and for inmates. And I want to just reiterate, my, my feelings about staff don't end with sexual harassment. There are a number of female staff members and frankly male staff members who feel sexually harassed by inmates on a daily basis. Um, one of the things that we found pretty prevalently with the research we did was that the institutions in Pennsylvania decided to, some of them, not all of them, decided to ring a bell when they walked on the block so um, they wanted to alert male inmates when a CO who was female was walking on their block so that they could you know, cover up or do whatever they wanted to do to make sure that they weren't seen by, a fe by female eyes. So she rings the bell and yells, female on block. And instead of putting on clothes, you can imagine what the male inmates do. So not all of them, and I, I don't mean to be facetious in my remarks, only to say that for her, Priya made her life harder, right? Before, it wasn't a big thing. They didn't know she was coming. She could get on that block and out of that block before she had to see a lot of male genitalia. And now it's commonplace and it's sort of a game that happens more often than not for her. At the same time, um, female inmates are filing more charges than ever against male COs at um, female institutions, not only in my state, not the state where I'm working, Pennsylvania, but across the US from what I'm understanding from my colleagues. And it may mean that they're filing frivolous charges. It may mean that for once they're speaking up. And I'm not sure how that data is going to play out yet, but at least it's being reported. And I think that's an important thing. Well, I want to thank you all for sharing your evening with us. And thank you, Danielle, for sharing your thank story you. with us. Really appreciate it. And we'll continue our series next Tuesday with Judge Julie Robinson, who will be speaking about her role as an established career woman. And continue to follow the leader from there with our fourth installment with a woman in post-career retirement and how she continues to contribute to public service. Thank you very much. Thank you.